Daniel here for Tabletop for One and my top 10 small box solo games. And I thank you for joining me today. Now as a solo gamer, as you collect a lot of games, you tend to focus on small games at a particular point because as you can see, you run out of room rather quickly with the big games, but you start to amass a collection of smaller games. And I've got quite a few, I think maybe 20, 30, something like that. And so today I've come up with a list of the top 10 games. And so starting off at number 10, I have Nova Lux. Now, Nova Lux is a Kickstarter game that came out in like 2021, designed by Max Robbins. And it's an engine building resource game where you're trying to set up the colony of your planet before all the stars explode. <laughs> And so you have this modular board where you're moving around from star to star, harvesting resources from the stars and the planets, and then trying to get to the point where you have enough resources to build your colony before all the stars explode. It's a very quick game. There's not a lot of rules to it. And it's, it's quite fun. I, I enjoy my time with it. And it has a, a bigger brother impendium, which came out in 2022, which I have, but I haven't opened it yet. So I look forward to playing with that game as well because they can combine together. And so for number nine, if you know the name Iron Helm, you definitely know the games by this designer. Jason Glover has done so many games and he's done a lot of tin games. And one of them that comes to mind as a top game is Tin Helm. Now Tin Helm is a dungeon crawling game, which is like the, the little version of Iron Helm. And by the way, I have not played Iron Helm. I know, I know, I probably should. But Tin Helm offers you a small compact dungeon crawling experience with dice rolling, loot, and everything that goes with it. It's quite a great game. It's fast to play. If you've played any of Jason Glover's Tin Helm or Tin games, you you know exactly what to expect from his quality, from his art, and everything. The only reason why it's lower on the list is it's hard for me to play with my big hands. You can see how big my hands are compared to this. The components are very small. It's just hard for me to manipulate. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it's a great game, and I'm happy to have it in my collection. And so for number eight, uh, for, for us board gamers that tend to be nerds and geeks or whatever, we definitely like our diehard and alien movies. And these games, they offer that experience in two different forms. So I'm cheating here, putting two games for one. But we have the Hunted series. And of course we have the Hunted Mining Colony one here, and that's based on the Alien theme. And then the Hunted Kobayashi Tower, based on the Die Hard theme. Both of these games are fantastic. I think I got them for like $10 a piece. And so these are a little bit on the luck side of uh, gameplay. You have dice rolling in Kobayashi Tower. You have a dexterity game in the Alien game where you're, you're trying to toss the token into the box and hit the target on the Alien. It, it provides a very challenging experience. I don't know how many times I, I, I've thrown it past the box and off the table, but <laughs> that's just what happens. But it's still a very fun, quick experience. The art is a fantastic. It, it just, if you like those movies, these or both those games really lean into those movies and just provides a very fun thematic experience. And so for number seven, we go for a video game IP this time with Super Hot the Card Game. Now recently I started playing Super Hot again. The first time I played it months ago, I had such a difficulty with learning the game that I shut it back up and didn't play and I started playing it recently and I played a lot of it and so I really enjoy this game now this is a deck builder kind of game it's actually more like a deck manipulation game because you're you're trying to add cards to your deck that help you and get rid of cards that are weaker cards that end up in the line but the the holdback on this game is everything about it is so counterintuitive it, like, you're not trying to gain all these cards to your deck. Some of them you don't want to gain. And so you're trying to manipulate it that way. But also, the way this stuff's printed on the cards, normally in a deck building game, the cost is at the top and the benefit's at the bottom. 
this is opposite in this game. So it was really confusing for me to, to look at the, the top and realize that's what I get when I use that card, not to attack it or gain it to my hand. And so, yeah, there's some confusion with that. And uh, hey, how about if I do a solo playthrough later and teach you how to play this game? Because I think it's worth it. It's a very challenging game. There's huge amount of replayability with the amount of objectives that you can uh, choose from. Yeah, it's it's really good, but horrible rule book and counterintuitive process. Let me try and help you with that. And so for number six, I've mentioned this before, maybe in my Hidden Gems video, but I'm going to bring it up again. It's a small box game, and it's one of my favorites, and that is The Dead Eye. Now, this is a post-apocalyptic game with... Uh, push your luck elements, uh, kind of a, a, a little bit of a deck ma management kind of game. And it's very challenging as you proceed through all the different objectives. And I haven't beaten the whole game. I've never gone through a complete game without losing, but it's very good. The art is fantastic. I love the art of the game and the art actually allows you to wear 3D glasses and see everything 3D on there. One of the really cool things about that is some of the cards you use, you turn when you use them in the 3D, that turns it off or, or uh, I forget exactly how it works, but when you turn them, it changes it so you know it's been used. It, it's just, it's really interesting how they developed that. It's fantastic. So I, I, I've, again, I've talked about this before. I won't talk about it much more, but yeah, number six, Dead Eye, definitely worth having in your collection if you like small box games. And so for number five, I have one of the, my favorite designers. He's designed this game. He does a lot of war games, very big in the solo community. You'll know him from Pavlov's House and other games. But this time he made a war game that was cards only. And that's Resist. And now Resist is like not exactly a deck building game. It's the opposite. It's like a deck deconstruction game. You're going to be using cards from your hand and you can choose whether you want to use them and then lose the card for a great benefit or or use them for a lesser benefit but be able to keep it later for objectives. And so it's a very challenging game. The objectives get harder and harder as you go and it's really an efficiency puzzle as you're trying to decide when to use the cards and how to use them. It's fantastic. It's a great introduction to a card-driven war game without a map and without a lot of moving components as it's just cards. It's also very accessible for its price. I've seen it for like $20, maybe on Miniature Market or, uh, or other game stores. But yeah, David Thompson, one of the best designers around in my opinion. And you definitely want to keep an eye out for his games. He's also got a new one coming out with uh, co-designed with Elizabeth Davidson from Beyond Solidaire, uh, Solitaire. So keep an eye out for that. But yeah, resist, really good. All right, my number four is one of the heaviest games in my collection. And I'm not talking about physical weight here. We're talking about complexity. And that's PAX Transhumanity. PAX Transhumanity coming in at about a 4.5 out of 5 on complexity. It's one of the PAX games. When, if you know PAX games, PAX games typically have variable victory conditions. And you're manipulating a society or a region or po politics, economics, and that sort of thing. In order to steer the game towards your victory conditions so that you'll win it and no one else will. Now, in Pax Transhumanity, there is a solo mode, which I do not use. I play this game multi-handed, like I play all my Pax games, because the gameplay is so much fun, so interesting, the decisions are fantastic, but this one is so different than all the other Pax games. It has this really interesting thing about, uh, as you're developing society, trying to propel society into the future, you're, you're developing patents and syndicating products and all sorts of things. And you're having to fund them and develop them and move them. And it, it's, like I said, really complicated. But all the moving parts are so fun. But the one thing about this game, it has the best economic finance board for tracking funds that I've seen in any game. Now, I, I do believe it's also used in... Um, Pax Emancipation, but I do not own that. I should get that. But yeah, it has the best finance board as you take out loans and fund, fundraise and, and gain income. 
oh man, it works so well in this game. And as you invest in various parts of the economics in the society, the funding that you get from those projects that you earned or produced get more and more powerful and are worth more money. Uh, the, there's so much I could say about this game, but it's so complicated and it's hard to explain. But don't go for this one unless you're willing to invest the time. It's going to take you 10 plays at least to understand the game. So keep that in mind. It is my number four, and it would be higher if it was easier to table. It just, it's not. It's a brain burner and definitely worth it for me personally. All right, I've got another two for one for you here at number three. Now, I've talked about one of these before, and that's Io, the samurai dueling game. Well, not a dueling game. It's this one samurai against the world kind of thing. It's like, uh, it's like John Wick, the samurai, or maybe 47 Ronin. What, one of those movies where you have one samurai against everybody. Fantastic game. Really interesting decision. I've said a lot before about this game. Again, I think this was in my Hidden Gems video. It's it's so good. I've played this game probably 20 times, at least maybe 30 times. Never tire of it. And it's very quick to play. But let's talk about Golems that came in the same box. These are both from Thundergriff Games. Now, Golems looks like just a set collection game. But you are choosing to draft cards from the main area and the cards you don't don't take go to the AI. And so it's this very interesting decision making as you're choosing the cards you want for your scoring but realizing that the AI is gonna get a bunch to score. It reminds me of Canopy, which has a similar mechanism for the AI. And so choosing your cards and letting the rest go to the AI, yeah, it's very, very challenging because the AI scores quick. And the art in this game is so good. I love the art of the elemental golems, of the different elements. Yeah, it, I love it. And of course, I got the, the playmat for it, and the playmat looks fantastic as well. But yeah, if you can get golems on, on a good price, you know, $15, $20, this one too, I played it almost just as much as Io. And yeah. Definitely love it. All right, so we're down to the final two. It was hard to choose between these two. As that goes with most, <laughs> most top 10 videos, it's hard to make the top 10. It, 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 you love all the games, but here it goes. Number two is Cristallo. Cristallo is uh, designed by Liberty Kiefer. It came out years ago and recently got a reprint in Barnes Noble, which is this edition here. And this is a pattern building game as you're, you're drawing cards, placing it out on a grid, you can overlap cards and you're trying to develop these patterns to free these spirit animals and, and they're in bonds by these magical gems. And so you're trying to free the animals and then you're going to use the leftover cards later to try and bind the black dragon. And it's a very challenging game. There's so much decision making in this game. It's just a deck of cards, but goodness gracious, it is brain burning for me. Like trying to maximize how you build those patterns because you want to build multiple patterns in one area, but it's difficult to do that. And, and it's very challenging, but oh, I think I spent $15, $16 on this game. It's fantastic. And on top of that, check this out. Liberty Kiefer reached out to me and she wants me to review her new expansions. She's got two new expansions for this game coming out this year. So look forward to that. I believe those are coming to me soon. And they look fantastic. So definitely check out Cristallo. It's so good. So worth it. I have a playthrough of it as well. So if you need help learning how to play the game, check out that playthrough. All right. <laughs> Here's my number one. You probably, oh uh, yeah, I don't have the label on the front of it there. This is not a small box. <laughs> but the game does come in a small box, probably the size of the Cristallo box here. <laughs> but this game is Elder Sign. Now I have everything for it in here. This is one of those uh, craft boxes here. And as you can see, I've got all the cards lined up here. And I've got the bags, I've got all the, whoa. <laughs> I've got all the mini cards over here with little uh, deck dividers. I've got all the expansions. Oh my goodness, Elder Sign. Elder Sign is a dice game if you don't know. And it is, uh, you know, built in the Arkham Horror universe, or the Lovecraftian universe. 
where you're tasked with exploring different locations, getting clues, and trying to stop the summoning of an elder god, and you have to gain elder sign tokens, depending on a, a number of them, depending on the elder god that you're fighting. But it's uh, the art is great, the gameplay is fun, it is a lot of luck, but some of the expansions make it easier on that, like the Unseen Forces, the Arkham uh, Gates expansion, uh, or Gates of Arkham expansion kind of expands the base game and allows for much more variability and, and a little more fun elements with the gates. And then the other expansions, oh, don't go that way unless you want to be punished. But they're really good. I, I think I like the Deep expansion the most. The Ice one's the hardest, I think, maybe. And then maybe Pharaoh and then Deep. I don't know. They're all pretty difficult. I, I actually haven't won any of them, but I still play them because... Elder Sign is not only my number one small box game, I know, I know it's not a small box, but it is also my number one dice game. I love this game. Oh man, I I just, I can't get enough of it. I, I don't know how many times I've played it now. 40? 50? Maybe more? <laughs> yeah. This, I've gotten my money's worth out of this game and I love it. I gave it its own box. I really need to get a nicer cover for the box or something. But yeah, great game. Elder Sign, highly recommend it. And so there you have it. That was my top 10 small box solo games list. You'll have to let me know in the comments below what you think of the games that I've shown here, if you've played them. Also, let me know what your top 10 games are. I'd love to hear them. I think you probably have games that I haven't even heard of. There's also lots of games that haven't made my list. There's also some games that are coming up in the, the future that I've done some uh, preview playthroughs for that might make this list in the future because I love those games so much and I'll talk about those in the previews. But I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from you. So ask me any questions in the comments below. Please like and subscribe to this channel if you like the content you see here and I thank you very much for watching Tabletop for One. Have a great night.